the right Einstein here the attack strand and have it done. Uh, so yes, so the, uh, in the last section we we introduced the Riemann tensor as a tensor that tells us about the mismatch of parallel transport. And we said that if we consider parallel transport in a vector along a loop along some infinitesimal loop, then that uh, parallel transported vector, so we start from here, we, we, have, we start from some vector, plug it in here, and then parallel transport it along some loop and come back. And the new vector that we obtain here might not coincide <coughs> uh, with the original one. Uh, it will be rotated. It, it, ha it will have the same length because we are working with this metric compatible parallel transport. So, uh, since it is metric compatible, it doesn't change the inner product. In particular, the length of the vector remains the same, but, uh, but it can be rotated compared to the other ones. And then the question was the, uh, the Riemann tensor was the object that would give us this rotation in the limit that we take this loop and make it infinitesimal so it's kind of a local property of the curvature of course this is something that happens on a curved uh, manifold uh, if I do parallel transfer on a flat uh, flat space then I will come back to the same point like if I do it on this on this plane if I move it around I always come back to the same vector so it is a true uh, characteristic of the curvature of the of the space that we are uh, we are doing the parallel transfer. Yes. Uh, Those metric compatibility also imply that the uh, uh, angles are preserved or not? The angles between like between two vectors. Uh, well, yes, because the inner product of those two vectors is preset. The length of the individuals is also preset. So Therefore, the angle is preset. So wouldn't it be like when I try to choose the two vectors as this vector uh -huh. and the tangent vector along the loop? Uh -huh. So there is an angle between them. So when I go back to the same point, uh -huh. uh, shouldn't the angle be preserved when I return? Uh, let's see. The angle between the well, not that here the tangent vector is not pointing in the same direction. Like we had, for example, rectangular. Oops, yeah. Last time, uh -huh. so they point different directions at the same point. Yeah. Uh, no, wait, wait a second. It's not. Um, yeah, because yeah, I'm sure we care. Um, you know, the angle is preserved if you are partly transporting the vectors, right? Now, for an, for a generic curve, the tangent of the the curve is not being parallel transported along it. So it's only true for geodesics. So this loop that I'm considering, this infinitesimal loop that I'm considering, is not a necessarily a geodesic. It's just what I curve that I like. There is no uh, no rule that this has to be a geodesic. If it happens to be a geodesic that forms this loop, then yes, it would be correct. So, if the angle preservation is broken when we are not on the geodesic, then also the length maybe can change after the No, no, no. Uh, the, the angle... So, what happens is that when you have... So, let's take this loop.
Um, so say I have two vectors a and b. Right. So let's part the transport a and b along this curve. So now here I get uh, I don't know here here I get uh, b prime and a prime. And here you get. Uh, a double prime and so on and then you come back here I don't know it becomes b triple prime and a triple prime so I parallel transport a and b and this parallel transport is guaranteed to preserve the angle between a and b but if if the if the curve is not a geodesic, the angle between this and the tangent vector is not guaranteed to be preserved because the tangent is not parallel transport. So uh, as long as you are parallel transporting two vectors, the angle between those two vectors is being preserved. Uh, assuming that your parallel transfer is uh, using the metric com is metric compatible. Did I answer? Okay. So, so yeah, Riemann takes care of this rotation. Tells us what how much do we need to rotate, and this is a proper. This is an intrinsic property of the of the manifold that tells us about its curvature. And uh, now we want to uh, calculate the curvature, Riemann curvature tensor for the for a sphere, just to just as an exercise. Uh, so, of, uh, so we we also talked about the symmetries of the Riemann. So Riemann was a uh, army new alphabet. It was a rank four tensor. Uh, and the way to think about it was that this, if I multiply by dx1 alpha dx2 beta, uh, uh, this is anti-symmetry in the exchange of alpha and beta. And this, this object, so this is essentially multiplying by the area of this little infinitesimal loop that we have. And uh, now it has, it's an object with index mu and nu, which is going to act on our original vector, v nu, to give the new vector, v mu. Sorry, the change. Uh, so one should think about this, this whole object as a generator of a rotation. That, uh, that gives us that infinitesimal rotation. So we want to use this fact that this, this object is going to be the generator of the rotation to calculate it for the sphere. So let's, uh, let's uh, uh, and we are, we are going to use maximally the symmetry properties of Rima. So one one prop one symmetry property was that it was anti-symmetric in alpha and beta. It was just by definition because it was one could think about it as a difference between two parallel transports in which the order of two paths is interchanged. So it is just by construction anti-symmetric in one and two index. Moreover, since if I lower that mu index using the metric, then uh, it has to be anti-symmetric in mu and nu because it's a generator of a rotation or a Lorentz transformation. Uh, so that is, uh, that we also know. So anti-symmetric mu and nu and anti-symmetric in alpha and beta. Uh, it has one other symmetry property that I did not derive and I will not derive now uh, and that other is uh, but there are many things called 
Bianchi identity. So this is a Sakat Bianchi identity. Um, wait, it follows from Bianchi identity for forms I think. That's why it's so. so it's the it's the fact that it's symmetric under the exchange of the first pair and the last pair. So this is equal to So it has this symmetry. Uh, now let us ask. Uh, let us ask what is the. Uh, let us use these properties and ask what would be the Riemann, the, the, the form of the Riemann tensor for a, for a sphere. Yes. Uh, is that a kind of property where alpha and beta and symmetric uh, uh -huh. comes from? This one. Yeah, yes. Uh -huh. Comes from that we have forms, or we didn't speak about this here, that we have two forms and they are anti-symmetric, or it's a... Uh, well, the fact that it's anti-symmetric uh, allows you to describe it as a two-form. Okay, okay. But, uh, but uh, the underlying reason is, is simpler than that. It's essentially the definition, the way I defined this Riemann. Remember, one way of defining is that I go along past one and then along past two mm -hmm. and then in next time I go along past uh, two and then along past one and come take the difference between the two mm -hmm. this is equivalent to going along the loop mm -hmm. and this is not by definition anti-symmetry under the exchange of one and two because if you exchange one and two you are exactly taking the opposite order so so if the, therefore by definition it has to be anti-symmetric under the exchange of alpha and beta. But as you said, if you uh, use the fact that alpha and beta are anti-symmetric and write dx and dx beta as a rich product and can get express this infinitesimal equation as an integral along the loop in which we can calculate bigger uh, differences along the loop in a vector through an integral, through a loop integral, which includes the forms as the line element. Um, well, not exactly as you said. Uh, you can use forms to express Riemann, but uh, I, I, I guess it's not the most the most urgent thing to do at this point. If you want to talk about the amount of rotation for an arbitrary curve rather than an infinitesimal. Yeah, that we are actually going to do right now. Again, you don't need to, you don't have to talk about forms to, to be able to talk about a finite rotation. Um, so, okay, let's go back to the sphere. The, the, what is the property of the sphere? The, the sphere is got to be, uh, there are uh, some, some spaces or space times that are called maximally symmetric. Uh, sphere is one of those, it's maximally symmetric. Uh, when it is maximally symmetric, then uh, well, what, it means is, what it means is that it really, at every point it looks like uh, it doesn't have any preferred, uh, preferred direction in it. Also the flat Euclidean space is maximally symmetric. So when, when a space is maximally symmetric, then the, the, the Riemann curvature, it has to be expressible just in terms of the metric. So if I have R mu nu alpha beta, the maximum symmetry, the fact that there is no preferred vector 
or tensor in this space means that the only thing that I can, the only way that I can express uh, Rima is uh, using G mu nu, the metric. So now, since there are four indices here, uh, I have to use two G mu nu. And then I can use the symmetries of the Riemann to put the indices. So it has to be anti-symmetry on, under the exchange of mu and nu, but G, mean G is symmetric, so it can, uh, it will be something like this. It will be G mu alpha, G nu beta, and then anti-symmetry forces me to have G mu beta, G nu alpha and there will be some free coefficient. So this is the most general form of the Riemann that I can write uh, for some maximally symmetric, ma maximally symmetric history, including the sphere. Now, uh, let's, the, therefore the whole task is to determine this C coefficient, this proportionality coefficient. For instance, as I said, also the Euclidean plane is maximally symmetric. So this, this also holds for Euclidean plane, but on Euclidean plane, this proportionality coefficient is zero. For the sphere, uh, what do we expect? Let's remember the form of this Rima. So the form of the Rima uh, is R mu nu alpha beta was uh, given by the alpha of gamma mu nu beta uh, plus gamma mu alpha lambda gamma lambda beta nu minus alpha and beta inter exchange. Uh, so, of course, if we know the metric of the sphere, so we can just plug it in here and calculate. Uh, and it's not that hard, to be honest, to calculate. Uh, in fact, you are encouraged to do. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's instructive to use this definition, so that's why we are going through this exercise. But let us at least have some expectation for what, what we expect for this C. So notice that this Riemann is an object which is a second order in derivatives, right? This gamma itself was something, uh, something which contained derivatives of the metric. So it was first order in derivatives. And then in order to consider Riemann, we are either taking one derivative or multiplying two of them. So it's a second order object in derivatives. Uh, metric itself is dimensionless, but it, it relates lengths to lengths. Uh, so this object C that we have here, it has to be, um, it has to have dimension of one over lengths square, because Riemann has dimension of one over lengths square. And uh, for, a, for a sphere, that length is uh, the only length that we, we can expect to appear there for the sphere is the radius of the sphere. And that's why, for instance, uh, if we talk about a plane, then for a plane, Rima is zero because you can think of it as a sphere whose radius is set to infinity. Okay, so we, we have some expectation for the, the C to be proportional to 1 over R squared. In fact, uh, since we know that proportionality, we can just set the radius to 1. And then whatever number that we obtain later, we can put the correct factor of R squared. So we consider a sphere of radius 1. And... Uh, let us also use the fact that we can all use the fact that we can always choose the coordinates to make a metric at one particular point flat, and it's 
the derivatives to be zero. So that sets this gamma to be zero. Of course, the derivative of gamma is like a second derivative of the metric, so, so that won't vanish. So setting the metric to zero and its first derivative to zero, which means this is equivalent to going to the local inertial frame, that doesn't set Riemann to zero. And that is, and the reason is obvious. Our Rima is a tensor, so it should, we shouldn't be able to set it to zero by going to some coordinate system, different coordinates. So let's go to a system in which g, or to, at, at one particular point, let's say g to be diagonal. So g mu nu is just delta mu nu. Uh, okay, so then at that part, so this is a point. This uh, pick a point. Uh, let me draw this here. We pick a point, P, and then we say the let's set the metric at point P to be uh, to be the Euclidean metric. So we are basically what's the meaning of this? We are putting a coordinate system that around this point P. It looks like a usual Cartesian coordinates. Of course, away from that, it's going to get deformed and everything. So at that point, if I look at this rim on the... Uh, what is the non-zero component of the rim on, if my metric looks like that, it will be R01 or uh, say one two, uh, so we have one, uh, one and two. We have two directions, so let's call them one. And two. There will be R one two one two, uh, which is C. Well, it's just C, and that is the only. That's the only non-zero component of Rima up to up to this symmetry. Uh, so every other non-zero component of the Rima is related to by this symmetry to this. Not surprisingly, that's why we have only one unknown number. Uh, so we have this R1212 and we want to determine that. So what does this R1212 tell us? It has to give us the, so if I, let's, let us expand this picture. So if I go around this loop, uh, one, two. If I go around this loop with size one on each side and come back, then this uh, R one, two, one, two times the area of this loop is going to, uh, so what do we call it, dx1, dx2. But the area of this loop is going to give me the rotation, uh, rotation of a vector. And uh, that rotation, ro now if, if we are just in two dimensions, so what is the rotation of a vector? Delta v1. Um, and then, uh, delta V2 is going to be uh, some delta theta times V1 and delta V1 is going to be minus delta theta times V2. Right, so I'm just considering a, an infinitesimal rotation. A general rotation in two-dimensional space is uh, V1 is equal to V1 cosine theta plus V2 sine theta. Or let's call it with V1 tilde. And V2 tilde is equal to V2 cosine theta minus V1 
one sin theta. So this is a general general rotation of a vector in two dimensional in two dimensional space. If you consider an infinitesimal rotation with angle theta, now I replace it with delta theta, so an infinitesimal rotation angle, then the changes uh, the change of uh, V2 is going to be um, okay, now there is a minus sign and in any case I'm not going to fix the sign for you I'll, I'll tell you how to fix the sign at the end so don't worry much about the sign but, uh, so the change of uh, the change of the second component is going to be given by minus delta theta v1 and the change of the first component is given by delta theta times v2. Uh, which, which is basically the statement that the, the generator of this infinitesimal rotation is just delta theta times uh, uh, one minus one. Okay. Yeah. Let's see the geometric description for this equation to 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 take the infinitesimal for v one and v two because you have you have for example v one this direction uh -huh. and you will rotate it like this. Oh, sorry. Oh, then so this v1 and v2 are just components of a vector. So uh, remember, we are, this, this one and two are just this mu new indices that I have here. Mm -hmm. Right? Take a vector v. Okay. Yes, but I'm just saying that if I go around this little loop, so my V was along here and then it rotates by some infinitesimal amount. This okay. infinitesimal amount I call it delta theta. But, but I want to determine this delta theta. Okay, then, because I was thinking that you're doing this in, in a plane, because you said that this point locally look like the, the infinitesimal geometry around it is, is a plane, so uh -huh. do, do you do it here in a plane or you do it still in, in, a, in a sphere, dx1 and dx2? Well, no, we are, in, we are in the sphere. At this point P, we are looking at, uh, at this point P, we made the metric to be flat. We went to a local inertial frame. So at that point, the metric uh, looks like flat. And therefore, a rotation at point P is just described by the usual expression that we have for a rotation. So we said, if I do some infinitesimal loop on a sphere, after we come back, we are going to have a little rotation. Now, I'm just describing that little rotation at that point P, where the metric is made uh, flat. At that particular point, so the, met, the in general, the, we are on this sphere. Uh, so what am I what am I trying to do? I'm just saying that uh, this angle delta theta that we have is uh, is just r one two one two times the area of this this is square. which is just c times dx1, dx2 or c times the area, element of area uh, ok, now uh, how do we determine this rotation angle? we go back to our uh, or uh, original picture of having ants moving vectors on the on the on this uh, surface on this sphere. Let's take a big take. Let's take a big loop. So we we start from the equator. 
and then we take this vector and we want to move it along a big, uh, big loop. The, how does the loop move? It moves from the equator to the north pole. And now on the north pole I have a vector that uh, points in that direction. Then when I arrive on the north pole, instead of going back to the equator at the same angle, I go back to the equator at the angle uh, 90 degrees. Um, so then I, I pile the transport here at angle 90 degrees. Or you can, you can decide to go all the way from the other side, so at angle pi whatever you like more. I, I'll do it 90 degrees. Then I come back here and then I pile the transport it back to the original. Now what is the amount of rotation that I gained? It was 90 degrees after doing this loop. Yes? Uh, this loop is a bigger loop, it's not an infinitesimal loop. Yeah. So, from that statement to go a big loop statement, uh -huh. you need to invoke some kind of a Stokes theorem, right? Uh, well, at the moment I haven't done anything. I just said if you move this vector on the sphere, you are going to uh, experience this amount of rotation. Uh, at the moment, there wasn't any. Uh, yeah, my previous question was about if you write it in a form, in a, in the form language, uh -huh. you can change from the infinitesimal picture to the bigger of pictures. That kind of the question. Uh, okay, I think we'll arrive there. Just wait, wait a bit. So for the moment, just. Uh, try to digest the fact that as I move this vector on this sphere, there is going to be a finite rotation. Uh, now, how do I relate this finite rotation to the Rima? Uh, that's easy. I don't need to use forms in particular. I just uh, divide this. So this region, there is a... Uh, there is a what have I done? I have divided this uh, sphere into eight pieces. Uh, let's see if I can draw a, the sphere divided into eight pieces. Um, does it look like anything? Maybe not. You, you should imagine that you... Um, no. Um, well maybe I could go all the way to the other side then I had to only cut it into four pieces uh, so imagine if I take the if I look, from, look at the sphere from the north pole so then the, here is the north pole and here is the equator and then my trajectory, if I look at it from the north pole, is that I started from the vector that was pointing, oh. sorry, the vector was pointing outward. And then I moved to the, moved to the north pole along this trajectory. So at the original, the vector was just pointing out. And then as I move, it's now pointing in this direction. And then I go back to the equator at angle 90 degrees. Now my vector points in this direction. And then I come back here. Now my vector looks like this. Uh, now this portion, there is a portion of the sphere that is enclosed by the loop that I travel. This portion of the sphere, now from here you can see that it's a quarter of the hemisphere which is one-eighth of the full sphere. So there is one-eighth of the full sphere that is enclosed in my loop. Now I want to understand uh, how to obtain this infinitesimal angle given the knowledge that when I travel along the loop that contains one-eighth of the sphere, I get 90 degree rotation. So how do I do that? I just divide 
this one is of this uh, sphere into little uh, uh, little loops so that a uh, finite loop that we have can be can be thought of as a superposition of many 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 little loops that I travel by this little app so I go along these little loops and add them off to get the full finite loop. Every one of those little loops are identical to the original one because the sphere is maximal symmetry. So no point of the sphere is different from any other point. So every one of those little loops uh, gains an angle delta theta which is given by this expression. When I add them off together, I will get the total rotation which was pi over 2 and then when I add them all together here I should get the same thing so C times the area the total area has to be equal to pi over 2 um, what is the area? the area is the area of 1 8 of the sphere so the area of the sphere is 4 pi Remember, we are working with the unit sphere. And then we are dividing it by 8. Pi over 2, which tells us c is equal to 1. In fact, if you wanted to put the radius here, or the sky L square, then c would be 1 over L square, as expected. So that's how we can determine the uh, the lemma using this uh, parallel transportation. Any questions about mm. Okay, so I've, uh, sorry. The argument for writing the Riemann tensor just a product of metric. Uh -huh. so if it was is maximally symmetric, or it was because we are going to the inertial frame. No, it's because it's maximally symmetric because there is no other uh, no other uh, intrinsic uh, tensors or vectors on a sphere. The so the one only one that, that exists is the metric itself, and, and if there is also a fully anti-symmetric one but that wouldn't match the symmetries of rim. But also we say that if we go to this inertial frame, that we can set the Christopher symbol to be zero, arbitrarily? Yeah. yeah, yeah. at the point we can set them to but zero, not, 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 not low, but... The relatives are zero, the Christopher symbol. Right, right. In fact, they are necessarily non-zero, on a sphere because the Riemann has to be non-zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least some of them, not all. Of course, you don't have to do this. Um, in most cases, you, you cannot even, we don't have that much symmetry, or it's not so simple to do that. We can just plug the expression for the metric in that, in, uh, in this equation, calculate the lemma. But it's nice to have in mind what it is doing for us. So, like on an arbitrary space or manifold, all these 
our uh, uh, all these tensors are point dependent uh, quantities, right? Uh huh. Yes. Yes. So when we, for example, go to an inertial frame in an arbitrary manifold, we mm -hmm. can do the same calculation using that complex formula of lemma. Right. But at the end, we have the value of curvature at just <coughs> that point. Mm -hmm. If I want to go to some other point, mm -hmm. I need to uh, do all the calculation from the beginning again. What the big, what do you mean begin, beginning? Like, I mean, you just need to do this calculation. That, that's that's the lemma. So if you know the metric, say in some I don't know in some coordinate system, if you know the metric, you just plug it in here and it gives you lemma. Yes, but my question is, in this example, all points are equal. So when we find the lemma tensor at one point, we ah. find it for all points. Yeah. Uh, for an arbitrary uh, manifold, mm -hmm. I can calculate this for the point P chosen uh, in which G mu is locally inertial. Uh, you don't need to. You don't need to go to a locally inertial yeah, frame. Yes. Uh, somehow I calculated. Uh, yeah. In some frame, and I have the uh, Riemann tensor value at that point. Now. Well. Uh, you don't really, I mean, so the, what the points of a man, let, let's consider more a concrete example. In fact, this is a concrete example. Let's do some concrete example. Say, or maybe we, we don't do this here. Let's do anti this So say someone gives you this metric. L squared minus one plus chi squared dt squared plus d chi squared 1 plus chi squared so if someone gave you this metric this is a two-dimensional metric uh, two-dimensional um, uh, space Lorentzian space uh, with these two coordinates t and chi right uh, okay, and then they ask to give calculate the lemma. So what do I do? I the metric of this manifold I know there is G T T equals minus L square one plus chi square, and then there is G chi chi equals L square divided by one plus chi square, right? Okay, given g, I know g as a function of my variables. From here, I can calculate gamma. Gamma, say, t, t, t. Gamma t, t, t is equal to g, t, t over 2 times derivative, sorry, it's t alpha, but since the metric is diagonal, it becomes just t, t. And then the, this expression they have to return here, they simplify it, it just becomes dt of gtt. But the metric does not depend on t, so this is equal to zero, for instance. Then you go to the next compound. The next compound is, uh, say, gamma chi tt. Then it's g chi chi over 2 times. Uh, the only non-zero term is going to be minus d chi of g t t, which is equal to um, so what are we going to get? We are going to get g chi chi with upper indices, so it will be 1 plus chi squared over 2, and then the derivative of g t t gives me uh, twice chi. So we get 2 chi 1 plus chi squared. Alright, this is the next compound. You continue like this to calculate all of the components of gamma. Once we calculate all of the components of gamma, then we take the second day, another derivative. Because this expression because so you continue at the end, what you get it will be R, different components of R, 
will have some expressions in terms of this coordinate. Uh, you don't calculate it at a point, you calculate it as a function of your coordinates and then your r will be a function of this. Uh, like here for instance, your metric is a function of chi because there is no t, t dependence. Now if we calculate Riemann for this uh, anti the Sitter space, you will discover that this Riemann r mean new alpha beta will also be a function of chi. And if you follow this procedure, you will find this function of chi. This will be a four in four rank four tensor, which is a function of chi. And for all points, this always doing this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you go through this exercise, then at the end you discover that actually it is maximal symmetry. So it has this form. I never went to a local inertia frame to do this calculation. You don't need to go to a local inertia frame to calculate them. Uh, in principle, it's a very, very straightforward thing. Maybe a bit tedious, but there is no, no ambiguity or subtlety. Just plug in and calculate, you get some expression. And then you can see that actually it was, uh, it had that form. Yeah. When we flip G x on in the expression, it, it was... Why, why did I flip it? Yes, it was 1 over... Oh, because uh, I was, this is the inverse metric. Right, remember the, the expression for gamma? Is G mu... What do I call this? sigma rho over 2 d mu g rho sigma plus d sigma g rho nu minus d rho g nu sigma ok so this, this, is an in, this is the inverse metric so the inverse metric is defined by the following g mu mu g mu alpha is equal to delta mu alpha right so now what is our metric our metric is a diagonal metric in this case and let me factor out this l square then there is a tt component which is one plus chi square there is no of diagonal element and then there is one over one plus chi square Right, this is no metric. Okay, okay, and then with the lower in this. So this is the metric with lower in this. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Now you want to invert it. The G inverse is the is the matrix that when it multiplies this it gives you one. And that is given by one over L square. I just did it in my head. And there is a minus sign. Right, this is the stat component, and this is that. And then, if you have a diagonal matrix and you want to invert it, you just invert individual terms on the on the diagonal. If you, if you are going to work uh, on something related to gravity, sooner or later you will have to calculate Riemann or this curvature tensor for some manifold. Uh, it's not, it's not a very pleasant calculation. Um, Okay. Um, well, how much 
Hashem, you have nothing. Uh, yes, yeah, so, and then there is just a couple of things and we are done. Uh, so we, we understood curvature or Rima. Now there is some Um, so there is a there is a theorem that I want to mention, and when when we understand that theorem, then we that basically uh, explains why einstein hilbert action that we wrote was the unique the unique gravitational action that. Uh, that we could write for GR for for this uh, for this uh, spin two gravity. The the theorem is that you can construct the metric of the manifold. So basically, if you know the metric, you know the locally at least you understand what the man how the manifold looks like. You know everything. The theorem is that you have. Uh, if you have Riemann and its derivatives, at a point you can construct the metric in the vicinity of that that point. And I'm not going to prove it, but essentially it says that all of the information, all of the intrinsic information about the curvature of the manifold is contained in Riemann and its in its derivatives. So. Uh, you could, in principle, ask, is there any other, because we identified something, Riemann, which gave us the mismatch, or, yeah, it gave us the mismatch of this parallel transfer. You could, in principle, ask, are there other intrinsic properties of the manifold that uh, is not contained in Riemann? And the statement is that, no, it's, it, everything is contained in Riemann and its derivatives. So you are, once you calculate Riemann and its derivatives, you have all of the information about the, at least local information about the curvature of the manifold. Uh, now, now we can go back to our, uh, our original quest for the action, for the gravitational action that we wanted to write for Jimmy and you. We wanted to write an action which is just the function of Jimmy and you. And we wanted this action, so we had some rule, it had to be generally covariant and this stuff. Uh, of course, we wanted to have some, and, uh, some inf contain information about the, the, the manifold, the curvature of the manifold. And this theorem tells us that the ingredients that we have to construct this uh, is basically the Riemann and its derivatives. So the rule was that we want to write an action which is integral d4x square root of g. That was just fixed, the fixed measure. And then the question is, uh, what can I put here? The thing that I'm going to put here, the Lagrangian has to be a scalar quantity. And this is scalar quantity, uh, which is just built of G mu nu, the, uh, this, uh, this theorem tells us that it has a very, there is some simple rule to organize the terms that can appear here. But firstly, I can just put one, or a constant, by lambda. So something that does not even know about curvature. Uh, that, that is called a cosmological constant. Uh, let me list a bunch of terms and then talk about it. Uh, say I am alpha r squared. Um, yeah, so we, we want to write some action which is, uh, which is a scale, or some Lagrangian which is a scalar. So what, uh, uh, what is the, what is the first thing to write? The first thing that we can write is just a constant. 
something I doesn't even know about Kerwetsch. Uh, this part, this satisfies all of the rules that we had. It is a general covariant action. Uh, it's called a cosmological constant. Uh, when the problem we just write in this and nothing else is that it doesn't reproduce the Newtonian gravity. Uh, which is not very surprising, there is no derivatives in this thing, it's just a constant. So the equation of motion that we are going to get for the metric is going to be just like uh, without any derivative. In fact, if you remember, we had uh, another requirement, which, which was that we already knew the quadratic action for this h mu nu because this is the, the action that the object we derived by requiring matching with the, with the linearized equation for a massless spin two field. That linearized equation was fully fixed. We know exactly what that is and we know we knew even the prefactor, the coefficient, so that it matches the Newtonian gravity. So of course this lambda does not is not going to reproduce that. That action, if you remember, it had it had two derivatives. It was a, it had a form which was something like d four x d mu h alpha beta d mu h alpha beta plus a bunch of other things. So lambda by itself is not enough. Uh, what is this other term that I have written? This is the Einstein-Hilbert action that we have. We introduced this Ricci scale before very briefly, but now we, are, we understand it better. So once we have Riemann with those symmetries, we can counteract its indices to obtain a rank 2 tensor, which is called the Ricci tensor. So note that this is essentially the only way that I can contract the indices of Rima. Uh, well, there was another, there is another possibility to contract with that, but it will give me uh, because of the symmetries of the Rima, it will give me the same uh, the same uh, tensor. In fact, this, uh, so this is called a Ricci, Ricci tensor, the only two-index tensor that I can construct using counteraction of the indices of the Rima. And it is sym symmetric under the exchange of mu and nu, uh, as follows from the symmetry properties of Rima. Uh, okay, now then from here we can also construct Ricci scalar or a scalar curvature by contracting these two indices of the Ricci tensor with the metric. And this R is what I have put there. Of course, I need a scalar quantity to put here, so I couldn't just put one rim on here. It would have meant too many free indices. Whatever sits here has to be a scalar. That was our rules for constructing the Lagrangian. So the, obj the only object that I can construct which is linear in Riemann is this Einstein-Hilbert action. Uh, we also discussed the number of derivatives in Riemann. It had two derivatives. This also matches what we required for the quadratic action for H, B, and U. The quadratic action that, that we wrote for H, B, and U, it had two derivatives. So this is, this is the object that had the, has the right number of derivatives also. Now, imagine if I want to go to higher orders, the only thing that I can do is to have either more Riemann tensors or take derivatives of Riemann. But in both situations, I'm going to have terms which have more derivatives. So, there is a counting, uh, there is a, uh, there is a limit in which 
I can truncate this series and just stop here and that, that limit is the limit in which I'm dealing with long wavelength fields now what long compared to what is uh, uh, I, I, I won't say much but in general if we are as long as, long as we don't care about very very short distance uh, gravitation of phenomena then we can just stop here at the lowest number of derivatives because derivatives as uh, you remember it is derivatives gives us factors of 1 over distance so if we go to very short distances then high derivative tends to become important and larger distances they are less important so as long as you are not going to very short distances this is uh, this is the action the leading action that we have this is the only choice that we can the only choice that we have and it does actually reproduce the quadratic action that we wanted for h many up to the up to some total derivative that don't change the equation almost and this is the and this is the Einstein Hilbert action with this kappa determ determined so that we match the right coefficient for this quadratic action. Why did we erase Armenu? Uh, R and Armenu do not have the same amount of uh, derivative order? Well, I, what I erased were things which were second order in R. R square one. Like R so square. Uh, so this, uh, this is like a four derivative term. Now the cosmological constant we have to erase if we want uh, Minkowski asymptotically Minkowski space time. In fact, in our universe we know that this lambda is non-zero. We don't live in Minkowski space time. We live in uh, asymptotically the sitter, which means that this lambda has some positive, has some tiny positive value. Uh, so in fact, this is the gravitational action that describes uh, our universe at large distance. Questions? Yeah. Uh, the information about the curvature is uh, inside the Riemann tensor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in our field equations, we have the Ricci tensor, and in our Hilbert, Einstein Hilbert, actually, we have the Ricci scalar. Yeah. So, how can we be sure that we're not losing information when we contract indices? And when we take the, the trace of which? Oh. Um, yeah, this is a good question. So you are asking, uh, and this is, I guess, something I didn't really talk about much. When I derive the equations of motion from this action, then one would like to ask. Now obviously I'm losing some for like our scalar Ricci does not have as as much information as the Riemann tensor has. Um, unless unless you are on some maximal symmetric manifold but generically, yeah, the, I'm losing some information as I'm doing this contract as I come here uh, but uh, first notice that there is no choice like I couldn't uh, I couldn't 
keep Riman here. So that is what I that that is the only possibility for writing the action. Now uh, now the question would be if I derive the equations of motion from this action. They are just multiplied by this general factor. And I also add the matter action. So that is going to give me the Einstein equation. Right? So if I set this to zero, that gives me R mu nu minus one half G mu nu R equals minus uh, eight pi G times T mu nu where t mu nu we defined before. Now, uh, you can ask, uh, here we have the equation of motion for the metric that only contains the Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar. Uh, and uh, one can ask, are we guaranteed to be able to solve for Rima? Uh, using the equations of motion. Uh, which is a good question. The answer is yes, but you, re you need some extra boundary conditions. So if you have... Uh, so how, do, how, how do we formulate the problem? The way we formulate the problem is that we say, uh, in a similar way as we formulate the problem for other field theories, uh, say, for instance, I have uh, uh, what is the what is the simple example? Like if I, in the case of the Maxwell theory, for instance, right? In the case of Maxwell theory, we have some equations which are dynamical. For instance, uh, E dot uh, is equal to um, I uh, remember which one is wrong. There's, there's always the sign that is uh, E dot is this and B dot is E and this is the one that is the minus. Say I, I'm solving Max, Maxwell uh, Maxwell equation in the in vacuum. So these two are so uh, say I have Maxwell equation. So what is the uh, what kind of questions do we want to ask? We want to say, for instance, do we have a well-defined initial value problem? Uh, given some initial data about this Maxwell field, can I evolve it forward and have the full knowledge of the electromagnetic field at later times? Uh, for instance, here when I formulate this in terms of E and B, it, uh, it's kind of uh, it's very simple to see that it's true. So I start from some initial initial condition with some initial E and B field which satisfy these two constraints and then I, I can basically uh, one way of making sure that the, the, this initial value problem is well defined is to see that you can actually formulate it uh, in a code and give it to a computer to calculate it at late time if computer can calculate it, you know for sure that it is something very defined. Uh, so, we say we start from the initial condition for E and B that satisfies these two constraints, and then for any time step, what I do is that I calculate KL of E, I change B according to that, and I calculate KL of B, I change E according to that, and these equations are consistent in the sense that those changes do not violate these constraint equations. So at the next time step, you have new E and B that satisfy the constraint equation. You can plug that new E and B 
in this equation and then go to the, make the next time step and then continue forward you get E and B for, uh, for the during the full time interval so here you will say the initial value problem is well defined I can uh, I can calculate E and B now for instance we could write the Maxwell action in terms of this vector potential that would give us these equations and then the question would be is this Maxwell action sufficient to give us E and B and the answer is this, this analysis tells us that the answer is yes now here we should ask the same like question can we have an initial value formulation of GR can we and uh, decompose this component of say Riemann or metric or whatever and we give some information on some initial slots and uh, evolve it forward in time and be guaranteed that for instance the constraint that we have are satisfied or we are not missing any information that is needed for the for the time evolution. Uh, I'm not going to give you the initial value formulation, but I, I am going to reassure you that yes, there is a well-defined initial value formulation, uh, but the, there is a question of boundary conditions, so if you have on certain situations, on certain space times, you will have initial value problem, which is well-defined, on some other space times, you need boundary conditions. Like for instance, in anti de Sitter space time, you need boundary conditions in addition to the initial condition for the initial for the evolution to be possible. And then yes, you will you will recover the full metric and therefore the full Riemann and its, all of its derivatives just using just by solving this equation. Actually, if you write R mu in terms of metric, the differential equation about yes. the metric. Yes. So if I solve for metric, once and for all, it's mm. an initial value. Yeah. Uh, then I now know all finite of, yes. not local part of it. Yes, yeah. So yes. it's not that I can yeah. metric, I solve the. Yeah, once you find the metric, you have uh, all information. You can calculate Riemann and all of this. In fact, uh, many cases we are instead we are doing it, this kind of things. We we use symmetries to find the full answer. Uh, like the problem, if the problem has enough symmetries, then you can just find the full answer of the problem without going through this initial value formulas. Well, if there are no symmetries, then no one has to do generally one has to do this, and that's what people do, for instance, when they consider uh, binary uh, black holes, a merger of black holes, and they want to calculate how much, or what is the gravitational wave pro profile that they emit, they actually put these equations on the computer and evolve it in time to see how these black holes merge and how much gravitational waves they emit. In the notes I do, I think it's 1 over 16 pi g. I think so. So action is 1 over 6. Well, that, uh, that they can determine for sure <laughs> whether it is 1 over this or just this. Uh, so you are, 
uh, we have a measure which, you, you know the action is dimensionless in natural units right. right so this r is dimension of 1 over length square yeah. uh, here we have length to the fourth so d 4x times r is length to the square uh, so you want to have this kappa to be dimension of 1 over length to the square uh, now in, in fact it's true that g uh, this Newton's constant in natural units it has a dimension of length to the square mm -hmm. in four dimensions for instance the way to one way to see it is that the gravitational radius is 2gm over c squared, but we are in natural units, so c is 1, which means that g is uh, rg over 2m, whose dimension is length squared, because mass is dimension of 1 over length, natural units.